Good morning. Uh, good morning. Welcome everybody to day two of Oil and Money. Um, it's great seeing uh, so many faces of you here this morning, uh, the morning after the uh, awards dinner. Um, my name is Oliver Klaus. I'm the Dubai Bureau Chief at Energy Intelligence. Um, and it's a great pleasure being here uh, this morning to moderate this breakfast session hosted by Shell uh, entitled Fit for the Future, Building a Sustainable Upstream Business. Uh, now, time is tight. Uh, there's plenty to talk about today. We have a packed program ahead. Uh, so I won't uh, waste any time introducing our featured speaker today, Andrew Brown, who many of you um, I know know very well. And he was appointed to the executive committee of Royal Dutch Shell in April 2012. And he's responsible for the company's global upstream business, which includes the exploration and production of oil and gas from conventional shale and deep water sources, um, all at a very challenging time for the industry. Uh, so I would like to uh, please join me in welcoming Andy. And uh, Andy, the floor is all yours. Thank you. So thank you very much, and thank you for getting up so early, because the dinner went rather late last night, so but please enjoy your breakfast and, and do feel like you can continue to eat and drink whilst I, whilst I talk. What I want to do in about 15 minutes is talk a little bit about the upstream in Shell, and firstly starting with the Shell strategy, but, but addressing the opportunity that we have through the BG combination as a springboard for delivery for ourselves but also what we're doing as a business to make ourselves fit for the future, because these are challenging times. First, I have to show you a disclaimer, and I think particularly at this moment, because we are in a closed period, so Oliver may challenge me on all sorts of forward-looking statements, I'm not going to say any, all right? And uh, please, I apologize for that. But I want to start very briefly from the starting point of Shell's strategy, and I want to address that we put first and foremost is that we have to be a world-class investment opportunity. And for the shareholders, I think that was absolutely music to their ears. But I think at the same time, we need to give our relevance in the industry, and we need to make sure we reduce our CO2 footprint as the world moves through energy transition. I'm not going to address energy transition in an explicit and deep way in my talk. But that doesn't mean to say that it isn't at the center of our minds about what we need to do as a business and what we need to do as industry to adapt ourselves to the future. But also, we also want to make sure that we create shared value with society. In other words, that we can work alongside society on providing energy to the world's population that continues to grow. But in this, and really facilitated by the, by the BG combination, we are high-grading our portfolio to a more resilient position. We are creating a portfolio of opportunities for future development that are advantaged. At the same time, we have to take costs out, and I'll talk about explicitly about how we do that, both in operating costs and in capital costs going forward. But also, we've got to focus on our execution on delivering projects on time and budget and driving operational excellence across our global organization. And we as a business in the upstream have not been efficient enough at that. But whilst we drive down costs, we cannot forget the obligation we have to keep people safe and to keep the oil and gas in the pipes. And I don't think anyone in industry should be mistaken that we somehow think we can relax on that side going forward. But at the center of this, to be a world-class investment opportunity, we have to look at our financial framework. That has to work. We have to address our debt position, which post BG combination now goes up to 28% gearing. And we do that for reducing costs and executing our divestment program. Now, BG integration. Firstly, BG integration gives us a great vehicle for driving synergies in the business. We bring these two big businesses together. We create a single entity that is able to take a $4.5 billion per year synergies 
and efficiencies out of the business. And we will deliver 4 billion of those in 2017. A lot is about bringing two big exploration portfolios together and making sure we go forward, we go more forward on a more focused basis. But at the same time, we will reduce our capital spending. Together, BG and Shell in 2014 spent $46 billion of capital. This year, we talk about 29 billion. And of those 29, 3 billion are capital leases. So actual cash is 26 billion. So that's a $20 billion capital cost reduction over those two years. So this is a real important vehicle for us to make our, our business more uh, profitable. But going forward, we've been very explicit that we have a cap of $30 billion on our annual capital costs. And we have a lower level of $24 billion, which is a soft floor. If the prices go lower, we are prepared to go below that level. But in our strategy, we're very, very explicit about our business and where we're spending our money. And we define strategic themes as either cash engines, ones that must deliver positive cash through the cycle, such as conventional oil and gas, such as our oil products business, such as our oil science mining business. And now, since the BG integration, because of the enormous step up in LNG, also our integrated gas business. We increased our equity LNG to 37, 39 million tonnes per annum of equity LNG and increased our production by 800,000 barrels a day through the combination. Growth, we want to invest in deep water and chemicals, and I'll come back to deep water later. And in terms of future opportunities, we have our shales business in the US, Canada, and Argentina and now an emerging new energies business, where we invest for future growth, and we will ramp up investment in due course. Now, the upstream business, and, and what does BG integration mean for us? Well, firstly, we're able to bring BG into our business, and for my business, that's a 24% increase in production, and do so without increasing our operating costs. So you immediately get an accelerator for reducing your unit operating cost. And you see by the dots there how quickly that's moved from 2014 through to 16. At the same time, we're improving the quality of how we manage the business, so our availability level goes up. And let me talk about some of the explicit things we do. Firstly, we're being very rigorous on how many people we need to take this company forward. And we have had in the upstream had to say goodbye, or are saying goodbye, to 5,000 people within our organization in staff and contractor positions. And in Shell, that number is 12,500. So this is a big reduction in overall workforce. At the same time, as we go through our divestment program, we are going to reduce the tail of our business. And we have been explicit that we are going to exit in the upstream from five to 10 countries, which is a big move for us, for a company in many places, have been in many countries for, for over a century. But we also need to capture this concept of lower forever. And I think for too long, we're waiting for the cavalry to arrive and the oil price to go up. But I think we have explicitly, we have to work on self-help. And at the same time, as we bring BG on board, we've had a great opportunity to reinvent our organization and what we call our targeted operating models. Basically, have a clean sheet approach to redefine what a lean organization looks like in our company. But at the same time, because BG was a tremendously successful company, uh, in particular in, in the LNG world, particularly in the deep water in Brazil, and was increasing in production. And we need to embrace the best people, the best systems, and the best processes that BG had. And we've been very, very explicit on that. And our integrated teams across the world, where we brought those two, two teams together, are more or less 50-50 BG and Shell legacy staff. And I think that's a really important part of this combination, to embrace the culture systems and processes of, of BG, where they add value for us. But more than that, in upstream, we're adopting what we call fit for the future. And this is about improving the business, I'll talk a little bit about how we go about that in a minute. 
Focusing on, first and foremost, to improve our process safety. Keeping that at the center of our attention. Halving the number of leaks that we have in our business. Improving our availability further through operational excellence. But also unlocking more production through low cost, what we call well and reservoir facility management. So low cost interventions to improve production. And finally, in, you know, including that, we want to continue to reduce our costs going forward. <coughs> and I want to give you one example of where we've been on this journey, probably the longest, and that's in our North Sea operations. In the last two years, we've taken 56% of the unit <coughs> operating costs in, in the UK. Now, of course, bringing BG and Shell together provides a good catalyst for that, bringing two big operating <coughs> positions, equity positions together. We have increased our availability by 25%. So we weren't at levels that were competitive before. But we've reduced 1,000 people from that organization. So 40% of the staff have come out of that organization. At the same time, we have halved the numbers of leaks that we've had in that business. This has been you know, a big accelerator for value in, in, in part of our industry that has really struggled in the last years to remain competitive. And you'll see that we explicitly talk about 470 different improvement initiatives that have been driven actually on a day-to-day -day basis by the leadership of our UK business. And I'll come back to how that works and how we're replicating that across the world. But it's not just the UK. I'll give a Gulf of Mexico example here, where we were uh, a couple of years ago in a position where we had 61 vessels that were dedicated to our you know, significant Gulf of Mexico deep water position. Next year, we're going to have 16 vessels dedicated to our business. We're taking $300 million out of logistics costs in the Gulf of Mexico. We're reducing the helicopter fleet, overall costs down by 59%. Now, you can say that's extraordinary, but how on earth do you achieve that? Well, you achieve that just by much better focus management much more focused utilization of the vessels we have under our control. Having helicopters only fly on their schedule and not when someone wants a new bit of equipment offshore. Making sure we do the time of motion study so when a vessel arrives in port, we halve the number of time it takes to reload it and send it off again. And it's just deep, you know, focus on the details of how you improve your business that is able to unlock these kind of Improvements, and you could say, "Boy, you know, you, you you were very inefficient in the past." And I think I'm not going to stand here and say somehow a miracle has happened here that we shouldn't have been doing before. But we are driving those costs out. And I want to come back to the fit for the future and what it means and what culturally it is meaning in the upstream for Shell. First and foremost, each organisation, and I have vice presidents that are responsible for each country operating have to set the context of that organization. Why are they there? What is their purpose? And what is their key priority? And for the UK, it was essentially to not get yourself into a position you're losing money on an operating cost basis. Improving and streamlining the efficiency organization and focusing less on the development opportunities that that mature basin has. <coughs> but it has to be leader-led. It has to be led from the, from the top of that organization. They have to make that organization feel uncomfortable. And they have to understand what their gap to potential is. And they do it not just by dreaming up a new target, but by deep, deep, deep benchmark of everything and anything they do to understand who is the best in base and to make sure that they assimilate and or even overtake the best in the base. But it's also about being action oriented. It's also about deciding what you're going to do tomorrow, not thinking about longer term dreams and plans. So this team meets on a very regular basis. As a leadership team, they meet every week and hold each other to account for what they're going to do the next day. And within that organization, they have something called the chief irritant. So it's individual the leadership, whose role is to challenge the paradigms of our industry, because we have a greater paradigm that needs to be challenged. So this is essentially continuous improvement on steroids. And as a result, the creativity of the organization is unleashed 
and you get the improvements like we see in the UK. And we see it in other places. We see it in Malaysia. We see it in our Netherlands organization. So this has been replicated across the world. And it's really just the start of the journey. And we call it a phrase that says, if you're not working on a problem, you are the problem. And that creates a paradigm in an organization that actually gets people to sit up. Um, and actually, I, I think that has unleashed quite a lot of creativity. But then it's not just about operations. We have to think of the future. So how are we going to improve the cost of our, our new developments in the industry? And here, we also see tremendous turnaround. So if you look at, in terms of the effectiveness, for instance, how we drill, we're drilling 30% faster in the Gulf of Mexico than we were a couple of years ago. Our wells and shales are half the cost they were three years ago for the same well. The variable spread rate, so this is the map equipment we take on a deep water rig, is now 40% lower than it was a couple of years ago. And as a result, our break-even price, so then this is where we get you know, a reasonable return um, on our, on our on our businesses, on our new developments. For many projects, has gone from around $70, let's say Vita, to $40 today. So you see you know, an enormous improvement in the quality of those investment opportunities through this real focus on execution. And I think shales, I mean, deep water has, in the last couple of years, gone through a really tremendous uh, improvement. But also, we all talk a lot about the shales business, which is, you know, has been phenomenal in the cost takeout that has occurred there. And our business is saying half the cost in the wells, 60% lower capital costs in our business, 70% lower overheads, and 35% more production. And that really then provides, you know, a, a real opportunity, even in a lower forever oil price, for economic developments going forward. And a lot of people ask me, so what's the best, shales or deep water? And my view is, you have to be best in both. Because the best of deep water and the best of shales are the big, best material <coughs> growth opportunities for the IOCs. And for us, the deep water, through the BG combination, is the big growth engine of the upstream today. We are doubling production from last year to the end of this decade, from 450 to 900,000 barrels a day. And we do that principally through two areas, Gulf of Mexico, which we've been in for a very long time, but also Brazil and the Santos Basin, and our partnership with Preparas, where we have now got nine FPSOs in our partnership online. That's three more this year, six more under construction. These are big 150,000 plus FPSOs. This is a business where the average well rate is 25,000 barrels a day. So this is a prolific business that is growing fast. Uh, and we're really delighted with the performance of Petrobras, the operator, and the partnership that is emerging there. And beyond that, we have the Libra development um, where we're making great progress. So that is the focus of today's growth. But we have a sleeping beauty in our shales business. And we have a resource base of around 12 billion barrels oil equivalent in, in shales. We've consolidated down to the sweet spots. We've gone from 11 basins to five basins. But within that, you see some tremendous improvement. I said half the well cost. So in the water cap, half the well cost and 130% more ultimate recovery per well. We have 3,500 potential well targets in the Permian where the break-even price is, is well below $50. In the ground birch, we now drill 5,000 meter wells in 9 to 12 days. We have 50 fracks in two days. We have multiple well pads, perhaps 14 wells. We build the facilities next to the wells as they're being drilled, and we hook them up. And even in a Canadian netback situation, which is a major discount to Henry Hub, they're still making positive cash, just because of the performance improvement that we've been able to create there. So I think, you know, I think, you know, it's a rosy picture, but it's one where 
I think self-help is, is absolutely uh, crucial for us. So I just want to summarize. BG has been a catalyst for, for us for improvement. We do have a big divestment program ahead of us, and we're making some steady progress. Here. But probably the biggest financial improvement is through this much lower capital costs. From a position in operating costs at IDS, but between Shell and BG in 2014, we're spending close to 50 billion. At the end of this year, we'll be at 40 billion. So these are big, sustainable improvements. But in terms of our operating portfolio, to strive down, to get our position down to $40 break even and lower. But at the same time, recognizing our industry goes through an energy transition. So whilst we are focused on the short term to deliver for the bottom line, we keep an eye on reducing our CO2 footprint, making the right decisions on the new developments that we're going after, to pursue CCS where we can, but also to be part of the debate how this energy system will transition and what role we will play within that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Very insightful. I think lots of interesting details on how Shell is uh, uh, positioning itself for the future. Um, I wanted to pick up on the uh, cost reductions and improving performance, but just one point just uh, uh, um, came to mind. You mentioned uh, best um, in both deep water yeah, yeah. and, and shales. What, I mean, what can we expect um, sort of over the next five years? How do you expect Shell's portfolio actually to evolve, um, you know, over that time frame, given that sort of focus area? Yeah, I think we've been, and I, we were, we had a capital markets day in, in June, and we went to the market and we talked about our portfolio, where we expected our business to move by 2020, and, and, and we talked about um, the free cash flow generating potential at a $60 world um, in, our, in our business. And I think the portfolio is, is pretty clear and explicit that, that we are, for instance, in deep water, investing for this growth to get us to, to a, new, a new position through these projects that are now coming down the break even growth to generate um, then that 900,000 barrels a day to generate, I think, five to seven, five billion of free cash flow in that business by 2020. At the same time, shales move it to a positive cash surplus position. Um, our integrated gas business, being very explicit about how that goes forward. Our conventional on gas, five billion free cash flow. But very explicit about what we're growing, what we're sustaining, and what we're holding for future value. Um, and just holding the line on those things, and not just being just, you know, distracted by new opportunities here and new opportunities there. Um, so our organization, our focus is, is all channeled down these strategic things. So I have a head of deep water global, I have two individuals that run commercial and gas, and an individual run shares, and that is their core focus. And then we have to make sure that they are competitive in their individual segment. Okay, um, uh, I do want to pick up as well again on the um, you know, what I just mentioned, cost reductions, improving performance. You mentioned that uh, unit operating costs in the UK has been yeah. down 56%. Um, broadly speaking, I mean, how much would you say have upstream costs come down during the past two years as shell industry-wide? And as an industry, if we have not yet reached peak cost cutting, um, which I gather from your remarks, uh, uh, what does it mean for planning going forward, both from a client um, and contract uh, uh, perspective? Yeah, so, you know, I, and obviously a lot of questions are, so what happens to the supply chain and all this? I, yeah. I, I tend to think we are really on the start of this journey. Yeah, so I talked about the costs that come out of the business already, you know, 8 and 15%, so 23% in, in the last couple of years, about, you know, having 24% more production this year at the same cost. So you can do the sums around that. Um, but I think what we find is, um, by these deep benchmarks, I mean, I, I think we've replicated a lot of the downstream did before us. I think the downstream have been a business that's been very, very focused on cash. Uh, and I see the upstream, and it's not just that, it's the other businesses as well, are becoming much more focused on cash, but much more focused on operational excellence, on doing things 
outcome focused, simple processes replicated across the world in a way any global organization <coughs> should behave. But with the supply chain, not necessarily, you know, it's not a zero sum game. This isn't about winners and losers. It's about working together with the supply chain to cut out the complexity of our business. And in that, we look at things about standardization, reducing the complexity of our own standards, you know, getting away from too many bespoke standards in our shell standards, adopting contractor standards when they are sufficient and fulfill our requirements. Um, so even on Thursday, I'm having a meeting with some CEOs of, of global contractors. We're focusing on safety, we're focusing on how do we make our industry much more focused on delivery and simplicity that will help them and help us. And I think that journey is just starting. Um, the, uh, uh, related to this, and it's something that came up in uh, our debates yesterday here, and we spoke about it briefly earlier with Mohammed Bakindo and Fatih Birol. You know, the uh, reduction in capital spending we have seen on the upstream, having raised concerns well over a potential uh, global supply crunch uh, hitting markets. Um, I mean, from your perspective, it, it, how much of a concern, of a concern <coughs> is that for you? And uh, you know, what do you think the industry at this point is positioned to sort of avoid this from, prevent this from happening? Yeah, so I think, you know, clearly we, we have to see the supply demand balance and, and the oil, you know, IEA talks about the oil demand going up 1.4, 1.5 million barrels a day every year. I think, yeah, clearly our industry is one, you have to reinvest for more production. So, so that is a fact and that's, that's a reality. I don't think we should just look at headline capex. Because then we ignore the fact that that capex is spent more effectively. And can generate more barrels for the for the same capex or for, you know, the same barrels for, for less capex. So a little bit of my point is, I don't, you know, I think we need to supply, sure we do supply the world with the, with the oil it needs and the gas it needs. Um, but I think we also need to, to recognize there are such strong improvements that you will see continuing production coming online. And we have to, you know, I think the industry and, and OPEC and everyone else will have to look at that balance. But today, our focus is, is not on that, it's on making sure we're profitable, making sure we're world-class investment opportunities. You think OPEC, IEA, may, may have to sort of revise some of their forecasts based on what you just said, uh, you know, take these um, efficiency improvements into into account, because it is an, it yeah. is an important point, right? It's no, I think, yeah, really so again, you need to look at the detail. Yeah. And, and second order effects, I think, oil price comes down, efficiency improves. I think you've got to factor the second order effects into the equation to get a true picture. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Shell Post uh, WG merger as well. Uh, if aggressive plans to sell, what, about $30 billion worth of yeah. assets um, in the next couple of years, um, how do you think Shell can achieve that in, in today's environment, uh, uh, in today's market conditions, low m a Brexit on top of it? Um, how, uh, you know, and, and have you identified the assets that uh, can, can you mention? Yeah, I mean, I, what I can say is that, uh, you know, we work this in the executive committee hard and, and, and we have a very clear idea of the assets that, that we will plan to divest. I, I will say that, you know, we have 16 uh, assets currently in the market, not necessarily public, that are over half a billion dollars value. So, you know, some between half and one and some above one, of course. Um, now, the market doesn't see that. Um, because these things take time. It takes time to data rooms, it takes time to get bids, and then to negotiate SPAs, and then we will announce. But we make steady progress. Um, and we are absolutely resolved to deliver 30 billion of low customers. But not just because our, cap, you know, our financial framework and our debt position needs that, but because it's an important part of our acceleration to focus the portfolio on a smaller number of resilient positions and to reduce the tail of our business. Um, and I think that progress, that, that process is going you know, reasonably well. Um, uh, okay, uh, the other point actually into this, in terms of the countries you plan on, on exiting, is there 
anything you can say uh, on that? You mentioned five to eight countries, right? Five to ten countries, yeah. Five to ten yeah. countries. Yeah. You want to exit, and that's across the globe. Yes. Can you break it down? Or no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Always was <laughs> fun, right? Um, okay, fair enough. The, um, the, uh, we, we have to leave it at this, uh, um, but on the BG integration, um, and you, you, you spoke about this springboard for change and the shift in growth priorities, yeah. uh, the new future opportunities. In terms of um, integrating BGs into Shell's processes, and how much of a challenge is this really? And where are you in, in that process today? It's a very complex undertaking now. It is, and I, you know, I, there are over a hundred different best practices in BG that we have identified and are adopting in our business. At the executive committee, we look at eight particular focuses, uh, areas. Um, and, you know, they, are, they go from things about how you simplify your standards um, to areas such as how do you assure your business and how do you do it in a much more focused way in a central assurance body that we've set up in the um, so it's really trying to understand what were the key good things about it. So every business has good parts of it and, and not so good parts of it. But to, you know, to really focus on where they had something distinctive, so that's interesting. But even getting to the point where you know, the, the way they did uh, expense claims was more efficient than ours. We're just going to adopt their system. Um, uh, an IT system around LNG trading, which their system was better than the one we were using. We're adopting that. So really understanding from processes, from systems, but also people, where they had some distinctive capabilities that we can actually help improve Shell's performance through adopting. Um, just one uh, more question from me before we open to the floor. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, upstream opportunities. Uh, I mean, we spoke about the people in sales, but new opportunities. Um, there are a number of big rounds coming up uh, this year and next. We, uh, we have Iran, which just announced, uh, well, it announced uh, um, its first uh, big round, um, so to say. We have Deepwater Mexico <coughs> coming up. Uh, the expected offshore offering in Abu Dhabi uh, um, this year or next. You also secured. Um, Three ETSA enhanced technical service agreements in, in Kuwait. Now, in today's low oil price environment, which of these opportunities are more, most attractive for you? What kind of new opportunities would you be looking at? And is the Kuwait model something maybe you know that you would expect to see being replicated elsewhere, or if, you know what's the advantage there, for example? I think in all these things, I think the first and foremost thing is does it compete for limited capital? <clears throat> so, if we did any of these deals or Something else has to give, yeah? So it has to be distinctly better than the portfolio of opportunities that we have at the moment. And there is tremendous internal competition for capital. So uh, reducing the supply of capital has created its own uh, improvement, but also you know, a, a very strong challenge. So any of these, I talked a bit about the break-even prices, you know, they've got to be resilient against lower price environments for them to have space in our portfolio. Um, so if we look at Mexico or Iran or Abu Dhabi, then it has to compete, it doesn't compete. We're not going to chase after barrels because we want to have some large number to quote in terms of production or reserves. The focus is on the shareholder and the return we can provide to the shareholder. So we want to follow the money and profitability over those parameters. And that, in a way, is so the Kuwait answer. So what did Kuwait need for us? They needed our capability, our processes, our systems, our way to, to plan and manage field developments. That's what they wanted. And we could provide that. And they can give us a reasonable return. But we don't need capital for that. I'm not saying that we're going to become a technical service provider. No, that's not the core of our business. But for Kuwait, it was a great model where we recognized what they needed, and we could provide that service. Now, our relationship with Kuwait is multiple, yeah? In terms of LNG supply, uh, providing services to the downstream business, lifting crude. So it's a multiple offering of opportunity, in which the, for us, the technical service was just part of that, you know, overall offering to a business that provides 
positive cash flows even at lower price. Okay, thank you. Well, I would like to turn to the audience. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of questions here. Uh, if you could just please raise your hand if you have any questions, and the mic will come your way. Hi, hello, it's Mark Ratz from Morgan Stanley. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the following. So you laid out so these future shelves, a more efficient, lower cost, um, all those good things. But of course, delivering that is a, is a journey that will take some time. What do you have in your mind as sort of the, the moment in the future? Is it second half 17? Is it into 2018? When sort of all of this will be sort of completed and you are where you currently sort of want to get to. Can you talk a bit about the timing of this? Yeah, I think these things all have their, I mean, I think we're very focused on cash today and, and, and you know, I don't think this is just the one it's all going to be okay by 2020, so bear with us. It is a journey to, to 2020 with, with car, you know, so we have set out the stall very explicitly that we do have a target for when the divestment um, will happen. We are bringing a lot of projects online, and I think this is a little bit of a part of our story that didn't talk about, but you know, in the last few months we've brought stones, the deepest um, facilities anywhere in the world producing today online, and you've seen cash accounts come online. Um, Malachi, um, you know, in, a few, in a few months' time, will be online. Shahalian will come online. We have a, Gorgon is, you know, it, is now uh, moving, uh, ramping up through, through the, the three trains. Um, one online, second coming online. I, I think, you know, this will provide quite a, a boost, and we talk about $10 billion of CFFO by 2018 from this wave of projects that, that we're bringing online. Um, and that, in terms of a, a cash generation machine, at the same time as we bring our cost down, <coughs> will show an improving uh, performance. Now, clearly, oil price and you know, refinery margins sit in amongst that you know, to make up the full equation. But the essence of the business on, is, on a, is on an improvement trend through to the, you know, the expectations that we've set out for 2020 in the capital markets. Uh, Ian, you were with RS Energy Group. I was just curious about Brazil. It's a clearly very important part of your portfolio. How have the changes that are taking place there affected your current activities and your plans for the next several years? Yeah, you know, so, you know, Brazil has been through, you know, significant political turmoil, in particular in the last uh, 12 months, and La Vajato are still quite active. But what I can my impression and, and my observation is this is on an improving trend. Um, President Temer, the new oil and gas minister, are, are very much focused on improving the business line. And you see that the opening of the pre salt is, is a good sign of, of, of their intentions there. And meanwhile, um, Petrobras under Pedro Parente is, is you know, really delivering and, and delivering these new FPSOs. <coughs> Um, on plan, head of plan, production going well, availability good. So the operating performance of this asset is, is, is excellent. Um, the environment they're working in is a bit volatile. But if I look at you know, the current government, the current government's policies, uh, I think we see a situation that is, that is becoming more stable and therefore you know, we gain our own confidence in the ability to do this business. But we will keep up keeping these FPSOs coming online. Production there will grow. Um, our cash surplus uh, from that business as a result, uh, given a, a likely all price projection, it is clearly growing. So yeah, I think this is a business that, that we will, and to Martin's point, that we will start to enjoy in the coming years um, as we move to the positive cash positions. Good morning, Tom Daly from Energy Intelligence. Thanks, Andy, for an engaging talk. I have a question about exploration. Um, how important is exploration for a company like Shell at a time when there's a strong focus on margins and return on capital, as you were talking about? I know your reserves also took a hit last year. Um, on the one hand, also rising concerns about climate policies and peak demand on the other. Is there a future you can see what big oil companies do, much less exploration? Yeah, and I and perhaps talk a little bit about our, our exploration strategy. You know, I think we, when we reflect on on the past years, and we've, we've unlocked six, six and a half billion barrels of resources over the last six years, including the deal we did on Hungary. 
um, at about four dollar finding cost. And, and you see where the value creation in that portfolio is. It, it, it's a lot around the Nearfield and Hartland. It's not. It's not the big um, multi-billion barrel uh, discoveries, but they're very high value, smaller, well, still significant um, discoveries. So if we look at the Gulf of Mexico, we discovered 1.3 billion barrels after the, in the last six years. 60% of that is post-FID already, and they're discovered in the last six years. So it isn't actually restocking for the long term future. It is creating competitive growth for these years. And, and the North Lit in particular, where we announced last quarter the Fort Sumter uh, discovery, is together with Appomattox makes a hub that we can keep full for a very long time. So exploration for us is a lot about unlocking the potential of the heartlands we really know and understand. But also very fast tiebacks in the near field side. Now, we have some frontier positions we look at, but today's focus, particularly in a cash-focused world, is on these high-value opportunities that provide a conveyor belt of new developments we can develop and hook up in a short time frame. And I think that, in, in many ways, is a, you know, is very, and, and we, we focus very not on barrels, but also on the value created by those discoveries. That's our focus. Um, and I think that, that helps provide sustainability for our business in the themes that we talk about. Uh, yes, uh, Casey Sattler with Energy Intelligence. I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, you know, as we've had the discussion about a potential supply crunch in, in the CapEx world, can you address that a bit on, in terms of you know, capital being more effective? But you know, what do you think is the potential for you know, infill drilling, these tiebacks, these kind of low-hanging fruit opportunities more broadly across the industry? Um, if, if more companies were to really put their focus on that, could, could that help bridge a potential supply gap in the medium term? Yeah, I mean, obviously the potential of, of continuously uh, infilling, infilling and tying back is, you know, has, it, has its limits. Um, yeah, and we, you know, you generally track, you know, what do the current fields do in terms of production and, you know, the, uh, four or five percent declines once you've taken those, those tiebacks and those infills into account. Um, so that can't be the only thing you do. But I think my point is, in a low price oil environment, we have a lot of those opportunities that will keep this conveyor belt of development opportunities that are attractive even in the lower oil price. Um, and I think you'll see more companies, and as I said earlier, we focus not just on those development opportunities, but how, do you, how can you optimize the well stock that we have today? How can you challenge when you have closed in wells so that you can open up again? How can you bean up wells that are being constrained? And I do think our industry has a lot of opportunities around that. And it's interesting, in this lower price world, I think you all see us performing rather well on production. Um, and it is this real focus on, on those opportunities that actually is delivering, I think, those barrels. Uh, and we, I think we can do that for a few more years to come. Okay, well, we have come to the end of the session, unfortunately. Um, I saw it was a very interesting uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, I would like to thank you, Andy, very much for being here with us this morning. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Shell for hosting this breakfast. Um, we'll be uh, moving over to the conference room uh, where the next session is going to start in uh, about 10 minutes. So uh, let's uh, give a hand of applause to you.